was also <coughs> part of the IFMSA, which Julie was talking about. IFMSA is Medical Students Association, so it's a federation of medical students from 110 countries. IFMSA in the Netherlands, for those of you here, is really big. It was one of the founders, and actually the secretariat of IFMSA is based um, here. So while pursuing my medical education, I got interested in global health. Primarily through the IFMSA, and I worked on the board for two years. Um, so during my last last year of IFMSA, I was the liaison to WHO. Um, but then I also got this interest in how I discovered global surgery. Um, and it's something we want to pursue in IFMSA. So there's now actually a small working group on global surgery. It means there are students across the world kind of engaging in global surgery. So if you're still a medical student and that's something you're interested in, please contact IFMSA the Netherlands. If you're not from the Netherlands, contact UPMP, or which is the German branch, um, and global, global surgery is something that you can engage in as a medical student, or anyone who's still a medical student. For anyone who's not a medical student, there are going to be global surgery workshops held by students across the world, and so if that's something you'd like to help them put together, you're very welcome. So, my presentation is going to be about, it's going to be about e-learning on the internet and global surgery, both from my perspective, coming from a low resource setting and being a student there and having an interest in global surgery, both from a surgical perspective and from a global health perspective. I'll also, also try to give a broader like, global overview of e-learning, um, the internet and how it interacts with global surgery. So I think as an introduction, something that I want to point out, what has already been said is that there's a limited surgical workforce. That's been said a lot today. I won't go into that. Um, the efforts to increase the number of surgeons in training as has been explained um, on the ground. But another thing I think that hasn't been pointed out is the limited workforce doesn't always have adequate access to the latest surgical information. So as a medical student in Kenya, if I wanted access to the medical, the latest surgical information, next year as an intern, if I want access to the latest surgical information, there's the internet, but can I access it? And is the information available for me in that setting? And that's what this um, talk is structured. So there are many e-platforms that one can use to access information, but I think what's most important is in a low-resource setting, can one access the latest information? There are various ways to access the latest information, and I'll kind of go through them and touch through them, some just based on research and some based on my experience. So one of the ways is telesurgery. Um, I find this an interesting concept because the faculties choose to share their experiences one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I think it's more collaborative, it's more interactive, and it's more ongoing. So this is an example of the National University of Rwanda and the National University of Virginia, and they have these teleconferences once, um, once a month. But both, both parties share their, their experiences. It's an ongoing thing, and so it's not, it's more, it, ha it has more sustainability um, than short-term missions and things like that, which have their place. But this is also another way that what's happening in Rwanda, what's happening in Virginia can continue. And I think this is something um, that can be looked into more in terms of global surgery and um, sharing information between low resources and high resource settings. Another way is um, telerobotics. So telerobotics, this is from research, um, is about um, remote surgery. Um, and it's been used between rural and teaching hospitals in developed countries. It won't always be possible to get a specialist to the low resource setting, but it's telerobotics one of the ways that can be looked into and um, kind of pursued to see if high, because it's about getting quality care to low resource settings, they're not just getting any care. And this is certainly one of the things that can be pursued. Other ways are telementary, where the other surgeon is mentored by a surgeon using electronic means, virtual surgery, and telerobotics. And there are a lot of talks about this. So if it's already being used in developed countries, between rural hospitals and teaching hospitals, there could be a place to use it in low resource settings. And maybe this is one of the things that can be pursued and in a sustainable way. So now from a more personal experience, um, massive open online courses are one of the things that are happening more and more. Global Health has quite a few. The University of Copenhagen does um, a ten-week, five-week course on global health and the John Hopkins does tons of them, and they're available on, on, those, um, on those platforms. It's a new trend, but I did a quick search for those in surgery. So as a student in Kenya, I wanted to have a global perspective 
of global surgery and do a quick course. Is it something I could find? I could actually only find one from Ethicon that happened in June this year on bariatric surgery, um, and one that's happening later on on C-section. But in terms of global surgery as a basic course, um, this is not something that's happening. So this is certainly a place where there is room for more involvement in terms of global surgery, um, especially for the basics. For the advanced, I'm sure they'll continue to happen. Um, this provides a great resource to an obstetrics um, resident in a low resource setting to have the latest information. But for people at a lower level, um, undergraduates, maybe people who have not yet established, there is room to have MOOCs. So universities interested in global surgery have the opportunity to uh, offer these MOOCs on these um, on these platforms. And I think that's a way that global surgery can go more into global health because it's happening on a large scale already. Um, another thing that's interesting is literature. So there is literature that's available on surgery, academic literature, um, literature also on the latest techniques and information. But what is not always available is access to this literature. So in low resource settings, it's not always possible to have access to this unless the university you're working for or the institution you're paid, uh, working for has paid for it. If not, you hit a paywall. I've hit tons of play walls and I was doing my integrated degree. I learned to um, work around abstracts because it wasn't always available in my university. And so even if there's latest information, um, even if it's academic information, if it's put on a journal of L cyber, someone in a low resource setting then doesn't have access to that information. Even if the research was conducted in that um, in that setting, they can't come back and, and get that information because it's behind a play wall. Um, this is an interesting um, a venture being done by some people. It's called Open Access Button, and it's an app that you put on your computer. And so every time you hit a paywall, you put it out. And these are some of the ways that people are trying to get beyond this, so that the information is available to those who need it. Because if someone does, um, someone does a research, for example, in Kenya, does a great publication and puts it up in a journal, then I don't have access to it behind that paywall. And I think that's something that really needs to be thought about in terms of global surgery. Um, there's also the idea of open access articles. So putting these type of articles and this type of academic literature uh, on open access um, platforms, um, it's a very complicated process and I only have five more minutes. But I think this is something that global surgery um, should think about. If more global surgery literature should be open access because then it can be accessed in your resource setting and then that would make it much more useful. Um, I think one other thing to think about is social media in terms of the internet. So my interest for global surgery and in global surgery has grown a lot because of because of this hashtag, global surgery. It's a very small global surgery community on Twitter. Um, and it's a really good way to interact with people and to learn a lot and also to share your ideas. Short videos on YouTube for someone in a low resource setting um, is something that's also very, very useful. So in closing, the challenges is Global surgery compared to the rest of global health has very low volume of electronic surgical material. Someone, as someone who's interested in both global health and surgery, whenever I try to search for more information on global surgery, it's not as available. Do give some great examples, but in the ocean of global health, that's a very, very small drop. The continued lack of access to information, so the people in low resource settings still can't access whatever information is available. And I think that's something for us to think about as a global. There are also the issues of internet access, electricity, and infrastructure. It may not be possible to do anything about this, but I think the internet access may be slow in a low resource setting, and I think it's important to think about what platform information is presented. For example, I've not been able to do some MOOCs because they are put on EDX, which is a high internet consuming thing, and I'm just not able to have that much internet, but I'm able to access Coursera. So information should be put on places that are easy to access, and I think that's something. I think talking about global surgery and kind of a positive note, I think the opportunities still remain many. There's an opportunity for increased electronic or surgical material from a global health perspective, putting it out there in whatever form or means, in pictures, in videos, and in academic literature, ideally in open access literature. Um, and then also putting it in a way that's accessible to those who may need it or in a low resource setting. Thank you very much for that excellent overview. Are there any questions? Yeah. Um, there's a platform called Today's Health where uh, a lot of information.
information about uh, a lot of the diseases is summarized and kept up to date by experts. Is that a tool that you can use? Um, yes, that's a tool we can use from a very academic perspective. So as a medical student, I did use up to date. But from a global health, global surgery, um, no, it not, may not be useful, but it's useful in an academic kind of medical field. Um, what I was going to say, apart from the fact that in the UK I also can't access everything, because all of my logins seem to say that I need to pay for everything, I think it's a global problem. Um, but also that, um, when I was working in Uganda, I found that lots of the literature wasn't even relevant to um, limited resources settings, so even the up to most up-to-date information wasn't helpful where I was. Do you think that there needs to be more literature available on how to cope with the specific diseases you know, in an up-to-date setting? Uh, that's a difficult question to answer. I think um, my answer to that is I think there's still also a lot of room for having information from low resource settings. I'm not sure I can answer that. I think that requires a more comprehensive answer. But for example, I think probably what you needed to do in Uganda maybe was already happening in Mozambique. But the platform where you get that information from Mozambique, I'm not so sure about. But I think that's also something to think about how to share information between low resource settings because there's an expertise that's there that can't be gotten in the health and just really benefit from extremely lack of information. I just want to add in that at least if you speak English, French, or uh, Spanish, Portuguese, there's yellow. It's like written like the Spanish word uh, of uh, heaven. And uh, it's like a pla platform where uh, at least Latin American, mostly researchers publish online free articles and uh, it, some, are the, some of them are of medical relevance and some are social sciences. But uh, it could, could be interesting, especially for different settings than Western medicine. Okay, so you know, um, <laughs> in addition, I, um, I just, one thing is that I don't remember the site. I, I had the same problem with that, I couldn't uh, access. There is a site where, uh, uh, where it directly uh, sent an email to the author and asking for research gate. Research gate? Research gate? Yeah, research gate. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed.